Welcome to You Should Read This. Uh, see, I'm here together with Tom van der Luba, um, and this is uh, us reviewing a book that we both have read and have appreciated. And this time round, it's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, uh, and which has become, a, I guess, a pretty famous book, uh, especially in business circles. Um, but more broadly, I mean, it's had a huge impact in a range of fields. Uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, is an Israeli psychologist um, and is the only psychologist to have run a, a Nobel Prize in economics, uh, which is interesting, uh, specifically behavioral economics. And his, yeah, his contribution with this book uh, for me has been especially around biases, which we'll get into. Or, you know, what, what is a cognitive bias and why is it important to understand them? He was I, perhaps the first author to really introduced me to this idea of bias. Um, and the famous characters of his book are the System 1 and, and System 2, which we'll also get into uh, as we discuss this book. Um, but before we go much further, Tom, you also read the book. What, what drew you to the book? Yeah, also, I'm a big fan of uh, biases and also about the whole, let's say, trying to understand decision-making processes because, but we'll probably also dive into that. You always have the impression that you take right decisions, but it's a little bit more complicated. So it's interesting uh, to, to see how those processes are. And in general, it's very interesting just to know, understand how the brain uh, works, uh, which is a pretty modern phenomena. Uh, and there are quite some books uh, read about this. Um, and I think, yeah, it gives us a lot of insights in how we act in also in daily life, not only in business, but also in daily life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's lay, lay out the, the, yeah, the main characters. Let's, let's say that the system one and system two, so these are fictitious. Uh, yeah, these aren't actual systems that can be identified in you know, particular structures in the brain, but it's just a way to think about the way our brain works. Um, and the first system one is effortless. You know, it provides us with answers to problems. It gives us uh, the choice that we should make without any conscious effort on our part. You know, sometimes it, it's our impulsive intuition, if you like. It's just the first answer that comes to us. And we rely on it all the time right, in, in, uh, throughout our, our daily life. And then the system two is effortful. Uh, we um, rely on system two when we're faced with complicated choices, which require or complicated situations which require us to analyze different options to think more rationally about a situation. And this is the slow thinking that he refers to. System one is our fast thinking. Uh, and of course, we've evolved this ability to make fast decisions we've needed to um, over the course of our evolution. Um, but as human beings, we also have this, this slow thinking capacity, this ability to reason things out. And he makes the point that very often a system one overrides system two. And so even when we try and use our system two, when we try and think rationally, system one overrides it. Even the most highly trained intellectuals, statisticians and so on, when they've tested these uh, individuals, they still fall prey uh, to system one when analyzing uh, situations where they could use their sort of statistical chops to come to a rational answer, they, they still are led by this uh, impulse from system one. Anything else to say about the, the systems as you understand them, Tom? No, I think you're totally right. But it's, uh, I think it's, um, if you reflect on this, and if we dive into these examples, um, you feel a little bit um, uh, annoyed also. So, so, so we as human beings think that we are totally rational species and it differs us from other uh, animals, so to say. Uh, and on the one hand, that's the case. But on the other hand, there are so many examples um, where we really have to reflect on and say, okay, oh, I thought I'm very rational and taking very rational decisions, but I'm not. So, and that's, uh, and that's a kind of eye opener, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I wondered if we might give an example of this, which is um, with the Linda example, um, which is from, from chapter 15, just to illustrate for people here. Um, so let's just read it out. Um, 
and for those listening, you can work this out for yourself. So Linda is a 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright. Uh, she majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice and also participated in anti-nuclear demonstrations. Um, now, from the following, which do you think uh, best fits this description of Linda? Linda is a teacher in an elementary school. Linda works in a bookstore and takes yoga classes. Linda is active in the feminist movement. Uh, Linda is a psychiatric social worker. Linda is a member of the League of Women Voters. Linda is a bank teller. Linda is an insurance salesperson. Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Now, when they put this to people uh, doing this exercise, um, consistently people choose uh, Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement as being more likely than Linda being a bank teller. Um, now, of course, rationally, statistically, the, uh, she's much more likely to be a bank teller than a bank take tell her who is active in the feminist movement. Um, but because we build this picture of Linda in our mind, based on our past experience of people who might have been similar to her in profile, um, we're led by system one towards Linda is a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Whereas, yeah, rationally speaking, uh, she's much more likely to be a plain old bank teller than she is to be a feminist bank teller. So. I thought that was a, you know, a good illustration of how we all fall prey to this tendency, or just, and just one, of course. Yeah, what, I, uh, what I like as an example, or dislike as an example, is um, let's have a look. It's about um, uh, uh, um, the jury, or let's say in court. So depending on the time where your case uh, is dealt with, uh, there's a higher chance of getting a, let's say, oh, yes. high, high, higher punishments, which I find, and there's a lot of research done on that. So, so when you ever have to, to be in court, then it should be in the morning, but not just before lunch. <laughs> That's right. Because, because if, you, if, you, if, you are, if your case is dealt with just before lunch, the chance, because they're hungry, um, you, you, will, you will punish much harder. So, which, which, which I found really, um, if you really have to think about this, I mean, these are very well-educated people. Their job is, is to, to, that, to weigh justice, et cetera. And then there's enormous correlation if they're hungry or not. So, um, I find it pretty striking. Right. And that speaks to, in fact, we had, that speaks to the, the all of research on willpower because that, that example also gets studied. Uh, Roy Baumaster, who was on uh, my other podcast, uh, you know, wrote the book Willpower, cites that example of um, where our, our ability to make rational decisions is in itself an act of willpower and willpower is depleted um, when we're unresourced. You know, if we're tired, if we're hungover, as you say, if we're hungry, we're less able to use our willpower. We're also less able to engage system two you know, in Kahneman's uh, lexicon. So uh, I think that's important. And was also and interesting it, and that, go on, sorry. It, it even goes further eh? because I, I mean, I read this in, uh, in, in, in Dutch, so I have a little bit problems with, uh, with, um, with, with the right examples, but there in this example, perhaps you remember it, they have to throw, how do you call this in a, in a, in a play? Um, uh, and there is a correlation between the numbers they, they have. So if you, if you, if you have those plays and you have from one to six, or here it is, uh, it is, uh, uh, um, and, yeah, it's called in Dutch, it's called Dobbelstenen. I, sh I should read the book in English when I do an English book class, by the way. Um, uh, but there is a correlation. So, but, but there's a lot of research done on that. So, so you do something and then, and then there's an experiment afterwards and there's no no connection whatsoever. So if, if, and if, and, and then, then, then let's say if you have a, here it says if they have a demand of points is higher of this, of this play, then also the punishments are higher, but it has nothing to do with this, 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 this game. And then afterwards the punishment. So it's, it's incredible that 
we would never expect that such a rational process uh, being in a jury or, or, or being active in court uh, that people are influenced by this. Right. I'm, I'm not sure I followed your example with the play and the point. So can you just break that down again. It's, um, it's, um, let's have a look which, um, it's the reference index is called. So, um, it's, let's have a look which, um, which chapter this is. It's, um, it's about, uh, rustic and biases. And then, and then it says, it says 11. Anchors. Yeah. Oh, okay. Rigging and a wheel of and fortune. And that's, and that's really, really striking. Right. And so, well, let's, should we talk about the anchoring effect? Is that, is that what you're referring to here? Yeah. Uh, and then you're talking, you're talking about justice, huh? You're talking about, about that, that, let's say, people in court have to decide on, let's say, how much time somebody has to spend behind bars. For certain. Yeah, and then, yeah and so then, you can and, imagine and, there, like, if the judge were to choose to say before instructing the jury to come up with a punishment, right, the, the guideline for this offense is 20 years in prison. He's probably going to get a different outcome than if, let's say, he were to say the average sentence for this crime is 10 years in prison, right? Because he'll anchor and then uh, yeah. the jury will, will use that as a reference point when they make their decision. Yeah. And yeah. that's an example of system one hijacking, right? Right? Because we yeah. just, oh, that's easy. That gives us an easy way to make a choice here. We can just, I can just reference my... Uh, you know, I can just make my judgment in reference to that, into yeah. that anchor. That's much easy, easier than me to fully engage system two and work through all the possible reasons that all the factors that might contribute to what my sensitive decision might be, and then to come up with a decision by myself. Yeah, and it, I mean, there are a lot of more, let's say, simpler examples. So if you, if you just go into a shop and it says, uh, uh, let's say, this trousers. Uh, the old price was this and it's crossed and then the new price is that, then there, I mean, that's perhaps something we realize. So if you go for jeans and it says this jeans costs 100 pounds and it's crossed and now it costs 50, then you say, oh, I, uh, 50 is cheap because before it was 100. That's something which probably just in daily life, we also realize a little bit as a human being. Yeah, but, but I, I must admit, I still fall prey to it. And I know this. I mean, that's what's also interesting is that it doesn't make a difference if you know this stuff, because this is a right. subconscious yeah. Yeah. system. Yeah. The yeah. people who understand these biases are no better. This is what's so sort of depressing <laughs> about it. Yeah. Are no better at avoiding yeah. being hijacked than their biases by the people who are unaware. Yeah, that's correct. And what is also perhaps interesting to take as an example is um, um, because the point you just make is that if you know something is wrong, but it's repeated all the time, then even your opinion is undermined or changes with that, which I also find a very good example, probably why yeah, people survive in, 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 in let's say, in, in dictatorship, so to say, or in this extreme uh, situation. So w we are not, we think we are able not to be influenced by that. And you see the same, uh, I mean, there are so many videos on this, let's say, uh, uh, if let's say there's a wall is white and then let's say uh, 10 people said it's blue, then also people start who enter the room saying, okay, it's blue, although everybody sees it's white. So it's, it's, it's very interesting how, how far this, this goes. There, there doesn't seem to be a limit on this. Right. Although, although we think we are very intelligent and very, and we, we decide for ourselves, but it's just not, in the end, it's just not the case. There are so many examples on about this. You're right. And in politics, and in, and in politics you also see this. So, uh, so that's why, and it's also in the book about authoritarian, uh, authoritarian leaders. It's a kind of, it's a kind of uh, commercial. Huh? You just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Um, 
uh, and then and then in a way your brain is is uh, yeah is influenced by that. Right, and we're seeing it right now in terms of people's est. If you go, if they've done surveys on how many people they think have died through COVID, and it's a massive multiple of the actual number of deaths because of the availability bias. Right, what's on the news right yeah. now? It's you know every day. It's it's how many people have died of COVID, and so that plays in people's psyches. And so system one latches onto that. They've we've we've created an an emotional experience in our reaction to that news report. And that lodges in our psyche and, and forms the basis of our availability bias. Yeah, and what I, what I also find, uh, let's say, a good example and probably also realize themselves that if you have slept well and if you are happy, then you, you, you just take better decisions. Uh, There's also this link to psychological safety, etc. Uh, and if you, if you fear, if you didn't sleep well, if you are hungry, etc., it has an enormous influence on the quality of your decision making. I mean, right. there are also examples in the book of that, but that, let's say this is probably something we as human beings are familiar with and we notice ourselves in, for instance, in meetings when it's, when it's, when it's going to lunchtime, but it, it, it goes much further than that. And that's what I find interesting about the book of Kahneman. Yeah. Yeah. Now the other, um, well, there's a couple of aspects that I, I found really helpful just in my daily life as a professional, two, two biases, should I say, right? That I found very useful um, that he describes. One is the, the, the validity illusion, right? And that's, uh, and I apply that especially, especially to planning. So a lot of the work I do when I'm consulting with companies is, is I'm engaging with people and their plans, right? They, they've got um, grand plans, let's say how they're going to change an organization. And what you see repeatedly as a pattern in these organizations, of course, and we'll all be familiar with this, is the go live date slips, right? You know, this moment in time when you predicted you're going to achieve X just keeps creeping forward and forward and forward. And every time it slips, nobody ever questions why they're engaged in this. They just sort of merrily get on with the replanning and then all get behind the new date. Um, Seemingly oblivious to the fact that they're incapable of, right? Yep. creating uh, a plan that, that, that they can, uh, that, that's uh, accurate and predictable. And that comes out of um, this, this optimism bias that we have, right, to um, anchor on like the best case scenario, our inability to consider unknown unknowns, our un- inability to consider that, you know, there may be things we haven't even considered that could affect our plan. Um, and so this, this results in us experiencing a validity illusion. We'll look at this plan and we'll tell ourselves it's valid for X, Y, Z reasons yeah. um, without considering that this is a product of, largely speaking, system one. Uh, it's, a, it's an intuition on where we think this date might land. It's not a fully you know, rational process that's produced this date. And in some ways, it, you know, perhaps we had, don't have the capability to calculate all of the factors um, that we would need to in order to create an accurate plan. Um, but yet, we engage in it anyway. And the, the point he makes in the book is that humans would, we would prefer to be certain and wrong <laughs> um, than uncertain and right. So, if yeah. the, you know, the, the correct um, assessment of the situation is this is not possible to predict. It's not possible to predict when we might achieve this Um, this particular activity, because we don't have all available at hand, we don't have the rational capability to come up with a uh, predictive model here. Um, uh, But I would, I don't want to feel uncertain. So I'd rather be wrong and certain. Uh, I think that's uh, such a sort of a powerful uh, concept to to take on. Perhaps what what is interesting is also that um uh, Kahneman uh, just very openly uh, explains that he's a big fan of uh, Nassim Taleb. Right. Uh, so the third part of the book uh, is about his confidence or overconfidence, etc., which you'll see in a lot of fields, especially in business. Uh, by the way, much stronger in business than in other parts of society. Uh, and there's enormous amount of examples. Uh, we also, uh, just before we started, we talked about Charlie Munger, uh, the, the colleague of uh, Warren Buffett. And those people, I like them a lot, also Taleb, because they have a very systematic way of, and the Kahneman does exactly the same, uh, listing all these biases or, or overconfidence examples. 
and then and then you read them, you go through them, and then you have, for instance, that a positive outcome doesn't have anything to do with a good process. So, so just splitting them. Um, but if there's a positive outcome, we think that we have a good process. This has nothing to do with each other. So, and this kind of this kind of things you see. I mean, you have them in the COVID crisis, but you have them in in management more or less all the time. And this whole black swan uh, topic. So we we act in a lot of situations as as if something is a surprise, but it's not. But that's because we don't analyze our ways of decision making. It's just mm. we do something and then it's positive, and then we think that our processes are excellent, and just it just not uh, the case. And this this third part of the book, there are a lot of examples of um, uh, of of Taleb. And um, the 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 chapter I like most as an entrepreneur is that entrepreneurs, which I also see all the time, they are the most extreme species of overconfident people, because that's why the reason they become entrepreneurs, because they think they they know much better than everybody else where there is a chance of selling something or producing something or leaving their former uh, company. Um, and 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 then I don't know if this is in, the, in, in in this book. I'm not quite sure anymore. But that even if you tell entrepreneurs with a lot of research that it doesn't make sense to start, and then they also proved after after they started that it didn't really didn't make sense. All those entrepreneurs they still go for it because they believe that they are the exception. Yeah. So which I find very interesting. So if people sometimes ask, should I become an entrepreneur? Then I always answer. From a statistical point of view, it's not a good decision. Right. Because the chance that you will survive is very, very small. So let's say with a company we're 50 now, uh, we're in the last 2%. So if you have a good bad corporate job, from a statistical point of view, it's, it's, it's not a good idea to uh, become an entrepreneur. Right. And then, and then you can say, it becomes a little bit better idea when you're 45 and have 20 years of corporate experience. Uh, but then people think that you should be a dropout from Harvard and then you have a bigger chance because then they take Zuckerberg and uh, Bill Gates, etc. But the, that's the statistical exception to the rule. Yeah. Yeah. But then, of course, it begs the question, well, if everybody... Um... <laughs> Only took decisions based on system two and never just dived in. Well, we wouldn't have entrepreneurship, and we, you know. No, but there are there are at least let's say if you if you have uh, enough experience. So the most ex- successful entrepreneurs, they are forty three or forty five when they start. There's a lot right. also research done on that. Yes, which, yes, yes. Which is which is, let's say I would say even perhaps common on the one hand common sense because if you have a lot of experience in a corporate environment. Then you know what's the right time. Perhaps you already have customers. You all have lessons learned, etc. So a certain amount of experience in a certain field gives you network, blah blah blah. So chances become higher. But just in general, uh, you see, and this uh, chapter twenty-four, they're just born optimists. So so, and and if you work in those companies, it's very very difficult. Also from a cultural point of view. That, that everybody is always in favor of doing something because they're all positive and we believe it will happen, et cetera. And, 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 and to say, oh, stop, is this, a right, is this a good idea? Should we do it the other way around? That's something which is very much cultivated by Ty Lepp, uh, and, and, and and others, uh, Charlie Munger, et cetera, because they are very consistently analyzing all these biases and all this all these mental mistakes you can make. And then they just do the whole checklist and they say, mm, this decision I just take, could it be a bias? Let's, let's check. And then they just check the whole list, but that's just what the general entrepreneur doesn't do. And that's no, why and I, that, and that in my itself point of view, it's a very good, yeah. example, very good book for this. Mm. And the level of discipline um, required to, um, yeah, to go through that process right, is, is something that would uh, defeat most people. I mean, I put myself in that class. I can't imagine myself sitting down with a list of biases and checking each of them off before I make a decision. I mean, I think that would take a certain 
diligence in one's personality. You need, you need to be a pretty special type to do yeah. that. Um, but I totally see the value of it. And in fact, we had um, uh, the author of, um, oh, what's the book? It, it, anyway, he was, it, his, his profession, well, he's a professor. Um, he's had a lot of interest, in, a lot of influence on the insurance industry and, and risk assessors. Mm-hmm. And he was making a, a similar point um, that risk assessors should have a, like a, a, a bias um, matrix that they apply to all of their assist- assessments when they're making them. Um, and that that should be part of um, risk assessment in general, right? And, and that I don't think that's permeated sort of consciousness, right? Is that we should do that on major programs, major projects, you know, insurance industry, yeah. is that we actually go through bias based risks, right? Yeah. You don't hear that, do you? Yeah. yeah. But that's why I find it interesting that those people who, who uh, do this more systematically, they are in this extreme financial uh, industry, or let's right. say extreme parts of financial industry. So Taleb eh, is a former trader, mm. uh, Charlie Munger uh, uh, analyzing, let's say, shall I buy the company or not? I mean, and then, and then they're ending up buying companies, but, but that's the end of an enormous process of analyzing all those companies. So, um, but you have the same side, you have the same aspect. Um, uh, there's a big correlation of people who are really good poker players. I mean, I don't know anything about poker, but uh, there you have the same mental process. So you have to analyze all these options and then say, okay, I go for this, for this decision. And then people say, okay, if I'm able to, to take all this data and analyze it, uh, then I have a chance to, to win. And it's the same process um, uh, Taleb does and uh, also Charlie Munger does. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I like about Taleb is uh, when he talks about his investing is that he won't look at, and he used to get in trouble for this, like from his bosses when he was in his de- early days of trader, from what I understand is he wouldn't like his, his, uh, you know, his boss might ask him, you know, how's your portfolio? Are you up or are you down? You know, what's going on? And, and, and he would consciously not, not check, right? He'd only check his, his portfolio. I, don't, I think it was once a quarter or something, you know, it was, it was period, but he's very disciplined about it. And he wouldn't, uh, you know, he wouldn't expose himself to the up and down on a daily basis because he knew that would excite his system one, right? That's going to yeah. get him into, you know, impulsive, emotional state that might have him make decisions that don't make sense. Um, so he deliberately um, detached himself from both his the you know the state of his portfolio and um, news in general, right? I mean, he's sort of famous for it. It's considered one of his big achievements is having completely given up news um, for the same reason uh, is is to avoid that daily hijack um, that our system one is so engaged with. Yeah, yeah, very much uh, focused on the short term and. Uh... It, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. It even has uh, the opposite effect. Yeah, but this me- media consumption is exactly the same topic. As if you read the first page of a newspaper, it doesn't matter where. It's 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 the opposite of what's really interesting in the long term. Right. And and it gives you a totally different different uh, view of the world. So if you take uh, there's always uh, somebody who. Uh, I mean, there's also misery going on. And then, but then you're, you're too much focused on, I don't know, a child which disappeared or an elderly lady, which was uh, lost her handbag, et cetera. So, so it gives you, and if you, if you read this day after day, uh, your, your, your whole, your whole idea of, of, of reality uh, changes. Right. Yeah. It has to do also with fear. eh? It's, uh, and then you're in the brain again. So. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where we talked about a little bit before, before we spoke is that, so there's this double edged sword of our sort of emotionally driven intuition, right? On the one hand, it, it can um, drive us to irrational decisions that, don't, that are not in our best interests. And yet, and yet, it, it's certainly my experience, it's my intuition, my emotional impulse, that when it comes to the most complex challenges, is, is my best source. For decision making, right? So there's a there's this interesting uh, paradox here that yeah, on the one hand, and so 
many of life situations, the worst thing we can do is trust our audition, uh, uh, intuition. And yet, in, in certainly in my experience, in the most meaningful uh, realms of my life and where I've had to make decisions, it's, it, it, it's been my intuition that has brought me to the right decision. But there is still, I, yeah, some, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit uh, uh, ambivalent. So uh, what I always find interesting is also, I think it's uh, chapter, chapter 19 is the first chapter of this uh, third part where it's about Taleb. And then they, and then they ask people to do a prediction. And then, and then I don't know, five years or 10 years later, they, or just after something took place, they analyze it again and they ask, what did you predict? And people just tell something totally different. So, so let's say, I, I really don't know if let's say certain opinions I have, I mean, I didn't write down every opinion in the past. And I would say, okay, no, this is not a good idea. You should do it like that. But perhaps also my view changed or, or I make exactly the same mistake and say, no, that always has been my, or that was my prediction. So I'm, I'm really, I think it's, 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 it's it, perhaps we're just not really totally fair if we analyze ourselves, but perhaps it's also, there's also reason for this because we're just more positive thinking. I don't know. I mean, it's probably also a biological reason uh, for this, but if we are very honest, probably let's say this whole idea, I, I, I take from an intuition, a right decision in many cases, perhaps it's right. If you talk about, let's say the prehistorical part of the brain and uh, running away and fear or fighting, etc. But on the other hand, when this becomes more rational, I, I'm really not quite, quite sure if, if, um, if, if this analysis we make now is, is as dishonest and incorrect as all these examples uh, show, show us in the book. So you're suggesting that what the even system two it is as prone to error in some cases, the system one is. Now, just for instance, I, I, I take this example uh, about this overconfidence, and then somebody asks a prediction. Prediction, and I mean, the more it goes to that, you have to say a number or who wins, etc. And then, and then you ask the same people, or they even taped then those predictions or these opinions, and they said, "It's my voice, but it must be. <laughs> it, it must have been somebody else." <laughs> I, I don't know who, who has the same voice, you know? So it's, it's a kind of, I don't know, a very strange way of, of, of behaving. And because of the fact that it's, it's, it's so extreme, it's, it's about the same aspect as if you talk about these court cases, where you would say, no, no, there's very well-educated people and they are so wise, etc., And that's why they are... Uh, have this responsibility to 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 decide uh, how long somebody has to, to to stay in prison. Even in this kind of situations, it doesn't work at all. So why why should it work when I have predicted something in the past or when I have taken a decision in the past and and think you now we have the right process in in place? Perhaps it also was much more luck involved. Uh, and, 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 and the process totally wrong, but we never found out. Right. And so what you're suggesting that you, you as an individual over, overestimate your ability to use your system too. Is that, is that what you're saying? No, the, no, for me, the question is why, why shouldn't I be much better than all the examples in the book? So if I would be responsible for, in court, I also would give higher sentences just before lunch. Right. Why wouldn't why 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 wouldn't I just stay, let's say, less vulnerable to that? Right, and I think why, well, that's why, yeah. Or or let's say we just talked about how much did we sleep. Why would I think that in the end, it although I think I don't need a lot of sleep, why why do I still have this overconfidence? That, that it doesn't influence my quality of decision-making when I, when I didn't sleep very well. Right. 
<laughs> well, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> see, see, I do. I, I am in full acceptance that I would be just as bad as those judges, right? Mm. I, I, um, now, I might not be present to the fact I'm sort of self-deluded in that way when I'm making the decision, but I, like if I step back, I know I'm just as prone to this as anybody else. I can but you have to in a lot of, in a lot of uh, things, uh, even in, 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 if it's about love or, I mean, you can, you can, you can put it or psychological stuff, et cetera, or uh, trusting people, et cetera. You just, you just don't know. And, 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 and it, the, the question is also, you can't do a kind of backtesting, you know, with, with, with stock, with stock, stocks you bought and you can do backtesting, but you can't do bad, back testing on let's say decision making uh on 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 on, on people no you know no, so it makes it, it makes it makes so so that's why i think that those people who are extremely uh intelligent in 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 in, in writing about all these biases etc uh they are from this very rational uh parts of life where you can do back testing I mean, right. if you if you if you study psychology, you can't do back testing on your patients, but if you if you buy stocks, then you can do back testing on your stocks, like Taleb or or uh, Charlie Munger. Right, right, right. So they've got they they've got some ways to hold almost hold their decision making to account, right? Because there's a more easily uh, yeah analyzable record right of their decisions so, and their so how how do you know that the decisions you consider to be the right ones because it was your intuition what what would have been the i mean it's, it's i find it very very difficult to uh yeah and of course ultimately i you know i have no basis on which to make that claim you know from a purely evidential basis it's it's uh, it's my intuition telling me that it's my intuition um, that in some cases uh, uh, serves me well. It's, and uh, I think there is one distinction I would make in the way that I use my, which is, you know, how I might build my case here, but I get, I get that I, there's no way of me proving this out, but is that when I sit with my intuition over time and I keep checking in, maybe it's through meditation, maybe it's through journaling. And like, I build a sense of a, a consistent theme coming through in terms of what my intuition is telling me over time. I, I believe that that to some degree inoculates me from um, this being a reactive emotional impulse um, to a particular circ circumstances at a moment in time, right? If this is the, you know, I know it gets, it talks about, you know, in spiritual um, sense as the quiet voice, right? Mm -hmm. It's that voice and, and it's, and it tends to be quite, you know, if, if I'm listening to it, it tends to be persistent and I, it keeps coming back and it keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and purely subjectively, when I've listened to that, uh, my subjective assessment of when I've listened to that is that it has produced good outcomes. Now, the other version of intuition, if you like, which is like the hot intuition, which is, oh, right, I'm, I'm, in, this, I'm, in, this pro I'm in this situation. I've got to act, right? I'm going to do this. When it's that, that more, yeah, when it's a decision that's made in a, in a, much, in a state of much more heightened emotions, in more heightened emotions, then I think that, my subjective assessment is that the decisions I've made based on that style of intuition or in that context, that those have not been good. They've almost yeah, I, always been poor. Yeah, but I still, for instance, uh, take in the book, uh, you have this hello, or hello effect, and he takes uh, management literature, Jim Collins. Mm. And, and I mean, there are a lot of, uh, this, uh, most of the management literature is, you take a certain amount of uh, companies, and then, and then uh, you even take, uh, let's say, revenues or profits or growth whatsoever. And, and here he takes Jim Collins. Build to loss, and then, and then he says, "It's just, it's just not true." So, um, um, which I find uh, very funny, um, uh, uh, because he he got his Nobel Prize on the on on, on uh, for economics. So, because he just then he just says, um, 
we see something successful and then we make the the correlation let's say the other way around so so the question also is if you let's say in hindsight let's say you say okay that was a good decision perhaps your brain just erases all the wrong decisions mm. and 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 you only you only see you only see a, a certain part of 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 your reality and you just you just you just pushes all the other stuff away um like we discussed before this effect of 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 repeating things which are which are not correct and so so it's i'm 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 let's say if you just read this i mean it's a, it's a thick book huh? so if you read all those examples um uh it's i think you become much more humble towards towards your idea that you that you take uh that you take those good decisions but but we as human beings are in a lot of cases not able to do the the 20 biases the check all check all the boxes uh which you could do perhaps for by, uh, buying a stock and 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 that still makes it very 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 difficult yeah no um you know, and I, I take your point. It may well be that I'm um, subject to my own biases, uh, even when I'm analyze, analyzing this uh, particular topic. Um, yes, and I think your point about his analysis of the good to great companies—you know, they, they thought they'd found a correlation, and they you know, distilled out all the characteristics and principles of the, behind these companies and wrote a book about it and said, you know, this is, this is, this is what you should do to have a great company. And of course, over the long run, uh, their performance, um, has been proved out to be, uh, you know, no better than, um, any other collection of companies that you might take. And I, no, and I think, and that speaks to your point about, you know, luck, luck has such a huge part to play in this, right? I mean, did these companies just happen to luck out with the right, in the right set of circumstances over that period? Yeah, or you, um, or you just to take perhaps a very practical example because people will probably know the books of uh, Malcolm Gladwell, Blink, etc. Mm. And then he just explains it. He says what we call intuition is just the amount of experience. Right. And so, what is intuition? Is intuition just that you have more experience than somebody else? Because let's say, and he take the fireman, I think, in the building, which is an yeah. example often taken because it just it feels strange here. But it's probably a kind of experience they have a certain, let's say that there is, there is a kind of smell or a heat or a, a noise or whatsoever. It, it just, and then he say it feels, it feels, it feels we have to leave the building and then experience firemen, they leave the building before it, it comes down. And then he would say now that that's just the amount of experience, but it's really, really difficult to, in that moment to, to, to grip this, this different aspects. Right. Which might explain serial entrepreneurs, because if we took everything yeah, you said on face right. value, serial, serial entrepreneurs shouldn't exist, right? They should be just as prone to luck as anyone else. And th there's no reason why they would consistently no, win over time. There's correlation. So private equity companies really like serial entrepreneurs, but they, they, they should still have skin in the game. Yeah, uh, but 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 the chances are are higher from a statistical point of view, uh, and then and then you take the positive ones. Eh? So you have an entrepreneur, he sells the company, and does the next one. But but they shouldn't they shouldn't be so rich that that there is no skin in the game. Right. So there is uh, there is uh, they they like they like uh, let's say professional investors like experienced entrepreneurs. And also the negative experiences, but it has to, but I mean, in the end, they should have more positive experience than negative ones, because otherwise eh, you wouldn't invest in them. But there, there is also kind of a correlation, which only would, let's say, defend this idea of experience. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah. I did do other thing that comes up, which is related is where he does that analysis of CEOs of companies, right? And there's only yeah. slightly better, better um, than even odds that a success, like a high-performing quote CEO, um, yeah. is going to have a, a company that's any more high-performing um, than those in its, you know, in its sector because luck plays such a, you know, such a vital 
is such a vital part um, of the performance of, of firms versus the individual skill of a CEO, which must be uncomfortable yeah. reading for any uh, remuneration committees of, uh, of large companies. Yeah. Yeah, but that, that, that's also what they what they know. There is not a huge difference. Yeah. Who's running the company? Yeah. So, but that, that that's the topic where he criticizes uh, uh, Jim uh, Jim Collins, and the the um, I think the 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 last part uh, of the book is about uh, let's say his topic. I think he got a Nobel Prize uh, for at uh, his whole behavioral uh, economics. Mm -hmm. Where we also so uh, this, this for uh, what the, what you also can measure much easier than 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 the other stuff, uh, um, uh, for instance, loss aversion, etc. Yes. So, but how will you measure loss aversion in this kind of things, uh, where you just can't count it in relationships, etc.? It's 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 just undoable. But if you if you if you just ask, let's say, just in numbers. Uh, would you go for this or that or how long do people still bet on certain uh, uh, stocks for instance that's something which you can really simple in a simple way measure uh, but 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 all those much more complicated decisions how 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 will you do a kind of back testing or how will you compare them that makes it uh, that makes it so difficult yeah yeah but the takeaway on that topic is that we um, we're much more prone to avoid loss than we are to chase gain, right? Yeah. And that makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. So when we're faced with um, even uh, a choice that's statistically in our favor, means we're more likely to get a gain than we are to experience a loss. Yeah. We'll avoid the gamble uh, because we're so averse to the potential loss. Yeah. Um, that's right. Which is a, it seems to be an, an interesting flaw. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I have to say with that, that aspect, I found less utility in my day-to-day -day decision the, the, the biases stuff I really get. And even though that is a form of bias, of course, loss aversion, um, in that in particular, I don't know, I, perhaps I would have found more relevance if I had, um, I don't know, some, a profession that, uh, meant I was needing to analyze risk to a greater degree. But yeah, for me, but this, the value was in the biases work. But for instance, you just to get the circle uh, uh, around, or how do you come back to the, to mm. the starting point? Is that this 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 last part where you talk about behavioral economics? It's just interesting that this whole idea, this something is rational, and this and this whole discipline of economics is an as an extreme example. Then he just says, and loss aversion uh, that you just explained. It's not rational because otherwise you would you would you would decide on much more let's say egalitarian uh, way, but we we don't we don't like uh, we don't we we are, we are uh, loss of her. So so just take this as an example for all the rest which you can't which you can't measure so uh, so so easily. Uh, and yeah, and then depending on 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 how important the decision is, then yeah, and then you can decide how how many biases you want to take into that. But let's say right. if you talk, if you just take as a business person, what I find very interesting, and it's also perhaps something for the for the COVID crisis, an interesting topic, is that if you just see that let's say in in business life, half of the time is is a recession period or difficult times. Or perhaps when it's not 50%, but would it be, let's say, 40? And if you just see how much liquidity companies have, it's as if they always are in the booming era, which is an extreme simple example to explain that it should be different. So you should have an enormous amount of cash in the bank just to be able to survive in these difficult times. But if you just see in general in our economy, uh, how many companies needed support immediately after a couple of weeks? That's enormous, which which illustrates just what we just discussed, that entrepreneurs or people who mainly have studied economics only live, let's say, in the positive, in the positive <laughs> yeah, yes. uh, 
era. And I think it's uh, the sky is the limit. But, uh, and then you come back to the Bible, seven, seven wealthy years and seven very difficult years. Uh, it's, it's the same. It's not, it's not 10 and four. No, it's seven, seven. Right, right. Just thought in, in that, uh, from that aspect, I thought Bill Gates was interesting, right? His, his, his uh, idea was that any company should always have a, at least a year's worth uh, of money in the bank to pay all of their staff and expenses. I mean, I thought, yeah, you know, sure. that, that's, that's interesting, uh, which I must admit, I don't have in terms of my personal finances, but it does make complete sense. I'm one of my more optimistic entrepreneurs living in system one, perhaps a bit too much. Um, so that's the, yeah, I think it's a powerful book from that perspective. It can, it, it provided a mirror to me in my own, um, because, you know, the extent to which I'm a rational thinker, because that's, I think that's something important to separate, right? You can be, you can have high intellect, intellect, but not, that doesn't necessarily correlate with how rational you are in terms of your decision-making. And he proves yeah, that that's outright. What he in some cases, yeah, in some cases, you, know, you found that the more educated somebody was, uh, the more likely they were to fall prey into system one. So, It also would be for another time, perhaps interesting that, for instance, women, if you talk about loss aversion, they stop earlier. Mm. So they are much, they, they in, in, in a lot of ways, take better decisions. Right. Because right. They, 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 this overconfidence is, 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 is much more a male, male uh, uh, yeah, uh, personality, so to say. Yeah. Which, which is also, I mean, you can go back to pre, uh, let's say, to the, to the, to the historic context, etc., eh? hunting, etc. But it's, uh, it's, uh, which I also find interesting. But I mean, it's such a, it's such a broad, uh, broad, uh, broad topic, and then you come to how, 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 how important is the collective, how important is the team, what's feminine mm. leader, leadership, etc. So I mean, there's so many other topics which which are interconnected to this because yeah. it, the, but I, I would say just as a conclusion, be aware of this over, overconfidence you have in a lot of different aspects. Yeah. 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 I'd say that. And then the second thing is, you know, read this book. If you like the sound of what we've discussed and, uh, and there's value in, in studying these biases, getting to understand them. Um, yeah. Or at least be aware. I be mean, aware if you, of them. Yeah. If you, if you, if you still say, no, I go for it. But then that's why I think one of the powerful, powerful examples in the, in the book is how to uh, solve it. And this, that would be my last remark is that you can, that, that if you take a decision, you to describe or take the time to, to write about the disaster. So you take a decision and, and, and you're forced to write about the negative outcome, how it's, how it's, uh, what was the effect of this negative outcome, which if you, let's go back to this very practical example, if you would have to write down what, what it would mean to go bankrupt, entrepreneurs would have more cash in the bank. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, what a uh, wonderful note to end this on. Um, Really appreciate it, uh, the conversation, Tom. Uh, I hope our listeners did too. You know, give some feedback on on these conversations, um, and uh, I look forward to the the next book and the next episode of You Should Read This. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Richard. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Should Read This with me, Richard Atherton, and my co-host Tom Vandeluba. If any of the material we covered in the show resonates with you. And if you're left with questions like, how do I implement this in my leadership? Or how do I take these ideas into my organization? I'd love to have a conversation about that. And you can book time directly into my calendar with the Canonly link in the episode description. And I'd love to have a conversation and talk more uh, about uh, the content in today's show. Cheers.